It's a great one. Looking forward to this one. Uh, Katie Daly. Pat Maloon heard bluegrass on the radio long before she ever saw it performed live. Her first memory was hearing Pike County Breakdown on a show called Rice Paddy Roundup on Armed Forces Radio while living on Okinawa as a teenage Army dependent. Hearing Earl Scruggs' banjo changed her life. Not long after returning to her hometown of Washington from Brevard College, she became part of the bluegrass community that tuned into Gary Henderson's Saturday morning bluegrass show on WAMU. She won a ticket giveaway when Gary asked his listeners to call in from a unique location. Pat called in from her job at the CIA and won. <laughs> Weeks later, Gary and Pat met at a party and he invited her to do a Who's Playing Where segment on his show. Because of her day job, Pat wasn't comfortable using her name on the air. Gary looked down to see Ralph Stanley's album spinning on the turntable and he decided to call Pat by the name we all know her as today, Katie Daly. Katie's bulletin board became a popular segment of the show. Full of zeal for radio and on fire for the music, Katie worked the phones, learned radio engineering, and helped spearhead bluegrass fundraising for the station. When WAMU decided to add eight more hours of bluegrass programming, which started at 10 to midnight Monday through Thursday, Katie and Gary split the shows between them. Dudley Canal says that show time is perfect. He said we could get together with a friend to practice our music. Then at 9.45, we would go to a 7-Eleven and eat to buy a quart of beer and park ourselves in front of a radio. We learned more about bluegrass, the musicians, and the history on that show than any time before or since. As a popular bluegrass personality, Katie was asked to MC at many festivals. She loved the seldom scenes music and emceed many shows for them over the years. The seldom scene remembered that and asked her to help induct them into the IBMA Hall of Fame at the 2012 awards show. WAMU attracted nationwide attention for its bluegrass programming, not only with listeners, but with other media. Katie did interviews with the Washington Post, the Washington Star, and the Louisville Courier Journal. She also appeared on ABC's 2020 as part of Hal Bruno's feature on bluegrass. Smart, articulate, and passionate, Katie presented bluegrass in a way we could all be proud. Like life, change comes to radio, and in 1980, after seven years at WAMU, Katie left for DC's WMZQ, one of the nation's top commercial country stations where she remained for 18 years, holding many jobs, including overnight DJ, AM program director, and public affairs director, which honed her interviewing skills for which she is renowned today. Katie worked many high-profile events during her WMZQ tenure, including serving as MC at Memorial Day services at Arlington National Cemetery, introducing Ricky Skaggs and the Air Force Band at Constitution Hall, and as the ring announcer at RFK Stadium in 1986 at the NWA Great American Bash between Ric Flair and Dusty Rhodes. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily for us, after 18 years, Katie came back to Bluegrass when she joined WAMU's Bluegrass Country. Her love for bluegrass was still apparent during each week weekday morning drive show. It was during that time that she won IBMA's Broadcaster of the Year Award in 2009 and 2011. In 2012, when Doc Watson passed away, it was Katie who was called upon by the PBS NewsHour to discuss Doc's legacy on behalf of the bluegrass community. In 2017, Katie became the first non-musician to be presented CBU's Washington Monument Award yeah. for, for her lifelong commitment to bluegrass music, for her many years of service as a radio host, and for documenting Washington, D.C.'s bluegrass history through her interviews. Katie retired from bluegrass country in 2017, but she continued doing bluegrass interviews, thanks to Bluegrass Today. Katie's also written liner notes for Epilogue, a tribute to John Duffy for Rebel Records' re-release of the seldom scene recorded live at the cellar door as well. One thing she would like you to know, she was not the screaming woman at the cellar door. <laughs> she wasn't even there that night. Earlier this year, wanting to add her voice to interviews, Katie launched the podcast, Bluegrass Stories. Years ago, years ago, Katie visited a fortune teller and charged her $5 for a reading. 
He read her cards and he told her two things. First, you will have one child. Katie said, only one? To which the fortune teller replied, how many do you want for five dollars, lady? <laughs> She and her husband, Bill, had Chris in 1981, their only child. Second, he said, you were involved in music. I don't know exactly what it is. It's not rock, it's not exactly country, but someday you will be known for your voice. Was he ever right? Katie's voice has been recognized by people in checkout lines, by customer service people on the phone, and by so many of us in the bluegrass community. We honor her today with a well-deserved Distinguished Achievement Award because she always used her voice to promote bluegrass. Ladies and gentlemen, Katie Daly. at night and now that I'm older I realize it was an odd choice of songs it was either the wreck of the old 97 or the prisoner song but my father who was a career intelligence officer was quite surprised to hear that I was going to give up a government job to play records on the radio they thought I had lost my security clearance I wish they were here today the one person who has been through this journey with me is here today my husband of 40 years, Bill Brown, made it possible for me to work on overnight shifts six days a week for seven years, to be away for weekends for festivals, and yes, to house musicians who needed a place to stay when they were in the area. You've put up with a lot. I love you for it. Thank you, Bill. I have to thank Gary Henderson for teaching me how to queue up records, how to edit tape with a razor blade, and all the other things I needed to know to do a radio show. Thank you, Gary, for a bluegrass education, a new career, and a new name. It's served me well. I had a well-spent youth partly because I was fortunate enough to grow up musically in the Washington, D.C. area. Thank you to everyone in the D.C. bluegrass community. You were so welcoming, and I have formed lifelong friendships with many of you. Thank you also to Alan Monday and the Country Gazette. You introduced me to new people and a different approach to our music, and I greatly appreciate that. I especially want to thank Pete Kuykendall, not only for his great contributions to bluegrass, but for being the first uh, promoter to pay me the same amount of money he paid the men for the same job. <laughs> sharing his philosophy with me. Everyone who works should be paid. And I pass that along to all of you who are asked to sing for exposure. Those were two men way ahead of their times. Speaking to promoters, thank you to Mary Daub and Carl Goldstein. They've gone beyond giving me a good job summer after summer. You've really made me feel at home at Gray Fox and at Delaware Valley. And thank you to my friend John Lawless of Bluegrass Today for watching the Nationals with me summer after painful summer and for publishing my interviews. Now I have a podcast called Bluegrass Stories with Howard Parker, and I know he would want me to tell this targeted audience. You can find it on iTunes, Google Podcast, and everywhere you can find your favorite podcast. I also want to thank Eric and Lee, the Gibson brothers. Thank you for your music. Thank you for sharing your family with me, and thank you for the friendship. It means the world to me. I've had the best seat in the house for music and interviews for 40 years. I know just how lucky I've been. Thank you to IBMA and to all of you for this great honor. All I ever wanted to do is tell people just how good you are. Thank you. <laughs> 